Hi there friends and welcome back to my tutorial gameplay series for RimWorld. I'm Icon and this is episode 2 where we will get food and electricity under control. Food and electricity go hand in hand for me because, well, the reasons will be quite obvious in a couple of minutes. Last episode we created ourselves a storage zone where all the stuff is now lying which we own. We created a couple of bedrooms for people as well, which are pretty bare bones. We only got those beds in there and that's that. As you can see here, these items have all different qualities depending on the construction level of the constructor. So having a high level in construction will yield better items. This is true for pretty much everything you do in this game. That's why I wanted to mention it at least once. So we got 47 package survival meals, those won't last forever. We will now need to acquire new food. How is that possible? There are three big ways of gaining food. First, that's using just what grows around you. It's not possible on every biome, but as you see here, berry bushes can be harvested. You see here how, man, how much percent of uh, it are already grown. When we go into the information table, we see that the harvest yield of a berry bush is 10. So if it's 69% grown, you can already estimate it's going to be around a yield of 7. Harvesting plants is done by designating them to be harvested. Don't go for cut plants because that would remove the whole berry bush wouldn't be too cool. So here we go, we assigned that to be harvested and now we check out our best plants person and now we right click that and prioritize this. So we now gathered our first five berries. So why is it only five and not seven? That's because if you check out the informations down here, there's also a value called plant harvest yield. So for some uh, for some reason we weren't able to harvest more from that. But as you see here, the skill is influencing how much harvest you have. So here it's also the same. The better the people are, the more they get out of something. Like I mentioned before, this is true for lots of things in RimWorld. So. These five berries won't be lasting forever and in general harvesting from the outside world is a way to keep yourself alive but it's certainly not the best way and it's not a sustainable way. So we can here double click these bushes to select more of them. You see here all the bushes in the screen got now selected but even with that we don't get too much into our stockpiles. Harvesting wild stu wild growing stuff is nevertheless a pretty s solid choice if you are just starting out and you need some food. Okay, but what are the other methods? We can go into the architecture menu and into the zoning menu and there we find the growing zones. This is where we can do our own agriculture. If you want to know where to put down a growing zone, check out the fertility overlay down here in the bottom right corner. It's that icon with the sprattling thing. And if we turn that on, the map changes to depict the fertility levels of the corner of the map. So orange is low fertility. This is only 70%. Slight green is 100 normal. Uh, 100% normal fertility and that rich dark green is rich soil with a higher fertility which is actually the best stuff you can plant plants on. So we're going to use the fertile ground we have here and you can either drop, drag and drop the zone while this mask is on or you turn off the mask and just drag and drop a few zones. So I'm going to drag and drop let's say three zones for now. As you can see here, they're barely visible, but you can actually see them. Like here, these zones have a, light, a slight tint of color beneath them. Best, best idea is you just uh, memorize where they are and don't you worry too much. As soon as they are planted, they are pretty obvious. Okay, so now we get to decide what kind of plant we will so out here. So the standard setting is the is the potato plant. How to select which plant? Potatoes, if we check them out, have a fertility requirement of 70%, which means they grow on 
soil and they have a sensitivity of 40 percent this means these plants don't really react too much to the soil they are growing in if we compare that now for example to the rice plant which has a fertility sensitivity of 100 percent and the same requirement the change is quite simply the difference is quite simply explained rice will benefit way more from a fertile ground than potatoes because of the higher sensitivity but what does that change it's pretty simple it will reduce the growth time so rice have a, has a growth time of three days which is one of, which is basically the fastest growing crop in the game the potato is a middle field plant which basically grows everywhere it's really its big advantage it needs double as long as the rice but it's pretty cool too the rice plant has a pretty low yield though if you look at this harvest yield it's six and the potato plant features a harvest yield of 11 so as you can figure you have three days versus 5.8 days the yield is overall the same in the long run the rice plant will only make more work so the third thing we can pick is the corn plant which is taking a whopping amount of 11.3 days so basically quadruple the amount of rice but also yielding a lot more harvest and featuring a high fertility sensitivity so this is your your long term your long term crop if you want something which grows for a long time go for corn plants last but not least we also have strawberry plants which are basically the cultivated version of the berry plants they are just in between the rice and the potatoes in terms of yield and growth time how to select it's quite easy the more people you have which are capable on, of working on the fields the better off you are with short growing plants like the rice plant if you only have one plant dude you should be probably aiming for corn because this is just the lowest cost efficiency but this is only a rule of thumb. If you really need desperately food, take rice. If you don't need food too desperately and you don't have, uh, you don't, you just want to put up a stockpile for the winter, corn is way to go. Potatoes, I wouldn't sow them where, whenever I have fertile ground because it's just a waste of all that extra fertility. So we're going to go for strawberry. Here we now have strawberry, corn, and rice in these amounts to just make sure that we have a little bit of everything so our friend pie now the next thing he does is making is getting his uh, hands dirty and working on that field first he removes all the plants which are bothering and then he'll try start to sew out so let's wait that out for a moment well obviously he starts to chop all the trees first but that's okay as you see here the colonists automatically remove everything on these so on these planting fields which bothers them so this is a new function on 1.3 so what we can do though is we can allow sewing or forbid sewing with this button this is pretty cool when it's uh, pretty close to winter like it's only a couple of days left to winter and you want to avoid that your people will sow out plants which will just die during the winter the other thing here is allow cutting or yes or no so basically if you don't want these plants to be cut you can forbid that too but I I can hardly think of a good reason to do that another cool thing worth mentioning about growth zones is that you can also use them to harvest wood because there's one nice trick if you put down a growing zone let's say below these berry bushes no it's just bushes yeah let's take this little patch if you put down a growing zone beneath a patch like this and then just disable the sewing function your people will then 
go over to this place and harvest everything which is ready to be harvested in this field. As long as there's a growing zone beneath the plants, your colonists, which are assigned to the jobs, will automatically harvest whatever is going ripe in there. Sometimes this can be really useful when you just want to make sure that your folks are only harvesting the stuff when it's completely 100%, or if you just want to harvest something when it's done and forget about it. Pretty cool stuff. So as you see here now, we're sowing out the rice plants and now they start growing on these fields. That's one very valuable and sustainable way of gaining food. And I'd say it's very, very important and very worth doing it. So one thing which I haven't covered today, and it's a very vital part of the food topic too, is that your colonists grow unhappy if they have to eat without a table. So in the needs menu, you see what your what your colonists get, um, what your colonists think about. I will explain that in another episode more thoroughly. I just wanted to pinpoint the eight without table mood debuff. I had to eat a meal of the ground. Can't we get a table around here? So tables are really important to these people. Like I said, the meanings of all this, I will explain that in another episode because right now. We really need to focus on certain topics, you know? So we're going to put down tables now in the apartments. And you could also just put down one table at a general communi uh, com commune place for everybody, but we're going to make single tables for everybody. Always keep in mind that they need to have a stool to sit on, otherwise your folks can't use those. Okay, so we are now preparing our food, but this food will take quite some time until it's grown. And also, we might eat these berries raw, but our people are way happier if we don't. So what can we do? We go over to the production menu, which is uh, which we haven't touched yet at all. Over here in the production menu, we see all the work tables, which are which are linked to some sort of production. So as we see here, there's a butcher table where we can process creatures into meat. Very important for our for our next things. So we're going to click that. As you see here, the table is also stuffable. The stuff your table is made of doesn't really have any impact on how good it works or anything like that. It's basically just a method for you to select whatever material you have plenty right now. So we're placing down the butcher table outside because butchering is a dirty work and dirt is really bad when you cook. Basically, when, when you want to cook something, you really should take care that the place is clean. So to make sure that we get a clean place to cook, we're going to put down a new structure here. We're going to place down a small kitchen here. and get that done by tomorrow. So far, so good. We are running out of food in, in the long run right now, but we will take care of that. And tomorrow, once these buildings are all done, we're going to explore the third method of gaining food, and that's hunting. But first, before we can do anything, we need to finish the kitchen here. Usually, when you don't have electricity, you can use a fuel stove or if you don't want to do that, head over to the temperature section and go for a campfire. You can also cook on a campfire. We though will go for the electric stove because electricity has the advantage that you don't need any fuel to work with. And we're going to put up electricity right away too because it's not that difficult to do that. So we're going to put up the electric stove over here. The electric stove needs steel and components. Luckily, we have these materials without any problem. So you see, Emmanuel now grabs his meal and eats it off the table because he's way happier doing so. And the other people now, well, they they don't value Emmanuel's privacy, but that's just what Rimworlders do. Okay, well, Emmanuel, please keep going. We have a schedule to do. So I'm going to fast forward this video now to the point where we have built those buildings and then we're going to continue with the next topic. Now, all I did was just skipping a little bit of time ahead. There was nothing 
that we needed to configure. It was just Emanuel building those things. And now there we are. As you see here, the electric stove has this uh, electricity icon. This basically means a play something needs electricity and doesn't get it. So we will put up something which produces electricity now. You find all these items in the power menu. At the beginning of the game, you can either use a wood fire generator, which just burns wood to produce electricity, or the wind turbine, which utilizes wind and doesn't need any fuel. The difference between these two is this one is reliable and has a pretty low yield of power. This one is unreliable and has a way higher yield of power. For the starters, I would always recommend you to use a wood fire generator to begin with, because these are way easier to, to control. So we're going to put down one generator here, down next to this uh, building. Generators can be outside or inside of rooms. If they are inside of rooms, they make the room warmer. And right now I don't want that. So we're going to place down the generator here. So let's tell Emanuel to do that by right clicking the building and selecting this from the drop down menu. And then he's going to gather all the materials, steel and components, and then start building it. And sometimes they fail while constructing things and waste 20% of the resources. Quite nasty, but what can we do? So we have a visitor. Sir Humps is, re is visiting us. What a nice uh, thing. So this is our first foreigner event. This guy is just passing by. He would sell some items to us, but then he'll. Do, but he's also just gonna leave our place. Since I don't want to cover the topic of trade right now, we're going to ignore Humps and just let him do his visit here. So this thing has been built. This icon tells us that this building needs fuel. As with everything, we just right click that building and prioritize refueling. Refueling stuff is by the way, a basic task. So that's why I have these basic tasks on a very, very high priority in general to make sure stuff like that happens quickly enough. So as we see here now, the generator is lit. It produces 1000 watt of energy and the stove consumes 350 watt of energy. As you see here, since these buildings are really close to each other, they immediately got connected. So the stove has now power. We also have a butcher table. So what now? So there are two methods of hunting in this game. Hunting actively and passively. I'm going to explain both of them now. So passive hunting is quite simple. You go into the work menu and then you see here there's the job called hunt. When you put this onto a high priority, your people will now check if there's something to be hunted. If we go into the wildlife tab, we see everything which is living on the map right now. But since we want to train right now on something harmless, we're going to train on the rat. Here we select it and you see here now we can either mark it for hunting or for taming. We're going to mark it for hunting and now let's see what Pi is up to. Pi cuts some grass and now he swapped his new job to hunting rat. Now he's using the gun that he has to hunt the rat. To make sure that somebody can hunt, it's important that they have a ranged weapon equipped, otherwise they are unable to hunt. And that's all. That's how you do automatic hunting. If you want to do manual hunting, you select the person you want to hunt with. Let's, uh, let's pick up Emanuel Ima for this regard. And you select the draft command. When people are drafted, they get that that line under the name and they can be com commanded pretty much like you are used to units in real-time strategy games. So right clicking somewhere while this dude is selected gives him a movement command and as you can already figure right clicking on something we can interact now. Oh we can't even shoot at our friends automatically that's good but if you would select the gun here and select bubbles Emanuel would still do that. Your people are ignore are really doing everything you tell them. Take handle this uh, handle this with care. So we're going to get over to this boom rad and hunt it manually. So we're if you mouse over over the weapon, you see how high the range of the weapon is. And now we just right click that thing and we see fire it boom rad. So here we go, and that's how you manually hunt. 
We're going to undraft Emanuel now because I don't really want to hunt and send him back home. When you have people drafted, take care to undraft them afterwards because otherwise they will stand still and uh, fall, fall over unconscious if you let them. Meanwhile, Pi has shot the rat and while hunting, you see, they shoot it and then they carry the bounty home. Since we have already configured the dumping stockpile zone to also accept bodies, Pi will now carry the dead rat over there. One thing that I really want to recommend to you is wherever you want to store the bodies to be butchered, you can disable that rotten bodies are accepted. We're going to explain that later when we configure the food storage. So. To transform the rat into something we can actually eat, we need the butcher table. So we're now going to introduce the first bill. Builds are basically work orders for this game. We're going to tell what kind of work, we're going to tell this table now what kind of work it is supposed to do. So we select the builds and now we can add a bill. Here you see I can either add the bill of butchering creatures or making kibble. Kibble is basically pet food but we're going to talk about that in another uh, episode. So we want to butcher creatures, yes. So we click that. Now we see we have the work job to butcher a creature one time. We can now increase that here or decrease that here. We can suspend that job, we can copy that job or we can delete that job, but I want to keep it actually. So here we can configure the nature of the job. Do X times, do until you have X. Well, that's not really applicable, but while butchering uh, stuff or do forever. That's what we're up to. We're going to tell this table to assign, to have a job to butcher creatures forever. When you select the details, you get a more detailed sight of what we see here. This is basically a shortened version of what we have here. And now we can here suspend it or not. Like I said, shortened version of what we see here. And what's now interesting is that we can first configure which stockpile zone the the finished product should be assigned to. So if you have a stockpile zone where your meat is supposed to be stored, you can actually tell it here. You can assign a specific worker, which is quite important sometimes because, you know, you might want to train a junior cook and let him only butcher stuff and not let him cook stuff because bad cooks can produce food poisoning, but more about later. Or you just let any worker handle that. Over here, you see what kind of um, bodies are allowed to be processed. If you open this up, you see here, this is all the stuff that you can't process. Automatically, by default, human-like corpses are disabled. But if you happen to have some cannibalistic people here, you can configure that too. For now, we are going to keep everything as it is. The only thing I want to change is the ingredient radius. This is basically telling you, you see the radius here? This job will only look for corpses to be butchered inside this radius, if I change that. If I don't have everything, this job will look for corpses all over the map. Since your colonists tend to run really stupidly long uh, tracks sometimes, the ingredient radius is a very, very valuable tool. Okay, we have this now set up, and now we get over to our cook. Well, Bubbles doesn't have a high cooking priority as of yet, so let's change that. Tomorrow Bubbles would just get up and do the job, but we're going to do it manually. So I'm going to right click at the butcher table, prioritize butchering, yes please. And as you see here, now Bubbles is automatically looking for the first item to process. She's uh, heading towards the rat corpse, heading over to this place, and now she's working on it. So after butchering a creature, we carry, she carries a portion of the meat and there's also leather left over. Butchering animals, like 95% of the time, leaves some leather. There's only a couple of creatures with, which have no leather. The leather is dependent on the creature you butcher and basically every single animal here has a different sort of hide. And if you check out the informations here, they also have different stats. But I'm going to explain that when we get deeper into crafting in general. So, now we have raw meat here. Raw meat doesn't make people too happy. 
You can transform raw meat at the electric stove. You see here the stove has the same builds menu as the butcher table and every production table in this game uses this builds menu, which is quite cool because this way you only have to learn one, one set of mechanics. We now add a bill and you see here, that's all the different kind of meals we can cook. There's simple meals, fine meals, veggie fine meals, carnivore fine meals and lavish meals split up into veggie and carnivore one more time. So it's quite simple. Simple meals only fill the belly, whereas fine meals and lavish meals make your people happy while eating them. And they need more res Lavish meals are actually wasting resources, whereas fine meals keep a balance between res resource usage and happiness, but they require a certain cooking level. Below that you see bulk jobs for cooking the same meal four times. And that's that. We want to start out with simple meals. So I'm going to assign two jobs though. I'm going to assign one single job and one quadruple job. As you see here now these arrows showed up and I want to have it like this. I want that my people first try to cook quadruple meals as often as possible and then later the rest. About food, I re uh, for food I really like to use the do until you have X button because this way I can tell the game how many rations there should be cooked and then they stop cooking and wasting times with that, time with that. My personal rule of thumb is two rations per person. So we are three persons, so we want to have six rations. So from here on, Bubbles can now be told to cook at this place. And if she does so, she holds those berries, 40 of them, and transforms them into meals. All right. As you see here, now we have simple meals. These are way more long lasting than other stuff because food has also a spoilage timer. So as you see here, the meat spoils in three days, the berries spoil, spoil in 22 days, the meals spoil in seven days. One cool thing is worth mentioning. If you cook a meal with a ingredient which spoils in like let's say six hours the fresh meal will still have its full shelf time so basically if you really want to maximize the usage and you don't have any refrigeration yet you can use those materials last minute so a simple meal yields a nutrition of 0.9 i'm going to talk about nutrition values later when we're going to talk about needs and all these things which will be the topic of the next episode so i'm going to talk about how much food somebody needs when we're going to talk about the needs in general please forgive me that this question will be answered another time okay so there's one simple way in RimWorld to stop food from decaying forever and that's by refrigerating it. So you putting up a refrigeration unit is quite simple. You just need a extra room. I'm going to do this like this. And I'm going to attach this room, this refrigeration room now directly to the kitchen because I really feel like that's a smart thing to do. We're going to apply a door here and we're going to apply a door here probably one on this side too because i don't want people to waste their time okay so i'm going to pause this video now until this stuff has all been built because the building the building process itself is not too educational and not too interesting either so most of the structure has been set up now i say most because i left open a part of the wall here for a reason the next thing we're going to do is create a new stockpile zone inside this room since i want this room to be used for food exclusively we're going to configure a storage zone for the first time for real so i really like to do for the first step if i want to configure a zone specifically to clear all so now we have forbidden everything to put it in and to be put into the freezer. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check mark everything considered foods in the game. So now everything considered foods is allowed in this area. I'm also going to allow plant matter here in the raw resources tab because I know that hops and these leaves have a shelf time too. And last but not least, you can also go into the manufactured area and activate herbal medicine here too because this has a shelf time too. Alright, but these things only 
on the side. Another thing which is really important for this type of room is to get into the corpses menu and allow at least animal corpses because it's the same like with uh, as with food. A corpse decomposes eventually and refrigerating it stops that process altogether. So what I strongly recommend though is that we turn off the allow the allow rotten check mark here. So basically now we have a corpse stump pile here which allows rotten and fresh ones and one here which only allows fresh ones. But since we now have a storage zone where food is allowed and another one where food is allowed, how would we get, uh, tell the game to use this first? This is why done by the prior by using the priority system. So here we tell the game that this is the preferred zone. What this does is now whenever food needs to be placed somewhere, the game checks now first, is there a storage zone which is critical and has food enabled? No. Is there a storage zone which is important and has food enabled? No. Is there a storage zone which has preferred and is, uh, has food enabled? Yes. Then it goes there first. If the answer is no again, it goes into normal. So this way with a priority system, you can tell the game where your foodstuffs are supposed to be. But this alone doesn't make a freezer, doesn't it? So to make a freezer, you need the coolers, and that's why I left open the space here. The coolers have to be rotated like this. The blue square goes inside and the red square goes outside. A cooler produces heat and it also produces cool air, but you always should take care that the cool thing goes inside and the warm thing goes outside. Pretty important. And if you don't use any mods, these uh, coolers replace walls. So that's why you, well, you are using the coolers as kind of like walls. So. And there's the first mad bunny here. So let's check it out. A local bunny has gone mad. I've already shown you how to hunt animals and this is the same method. We just select Emmanuel and Pi. As you see here, I can drag and drop this rectangle over them to select them both. I press the R button to draft them. This is my personal favorite to go to use. And then we're going to use to put these guys over here. And there goes the bunny. I tell them to shoot it. Obviously, Emmanuel is not in range yet. There we go. And that's how you fight. That's very basic how you fight. I'm going to explain combat uh, in more detail later. So now it's uh, it's close up, and Emmanuel now will use his uh, weapon no longer for shooting but for bashing. And we're going to melee attack with Pi here now too. There we go. So the bunny is dead. We can now allow that uh, bunny corpse to be carried, which is quite useful because we need food. But now, Emmanuel, be so kind and prioritize working on that. Okay. So now we got the cooling elements down. To make the coolers work, you select them and you see here they have a target temperature which is configured. And right now the cooler needs only 20 watt, but coolers have a varying power consumption depending on how much effort they have to do to keep some place cold. So now we're going to tell Pi to cut those trees so we can roof this place properly. And as you see here, my hauling people are already starting to put the food over to this place. Now let's just see if we can prioritize the roofing. Ah, here we go. So it's a roof here and now we have an indoors section. So we now reduce the target temperature to minus nine degree by pressing the minus 10 degree several times. You can, you can select it however you want to, but um, minus nine is my personal go-to temperature. And as we see here now, the indoors temperature of the of this room is lowering and lowering and lowering, and therefore, as you see here, it's the spoilage time gets higher and higher until it's frozen and it won't spoil anymore. So, as a rule of thumb, always install at least two coolers to your freezer. The amount of coolers necessary for your walk-in freezer is depending on the outside temperature and the size of the wall, uh, size of the room and the amount of walling. Basically, 
double walls insulate better than a single wall. My personal experience was always like that. Add two coolers. If it goes uh, easily into the temperature, you're good. And if it doesn't, just add coolers. Always try to have one more cooler than you actually need for the case that a heat wave stops by because heat waves are recurring events in this game which just increase the temperature on the map for quite some time. And if you don't have enough coolers during a heat wave, your refrigeration breaks and your stuff can spoil again. Okay, so we have handled the basics of electricity today which is quite simple. We just built a generator and due to the fact that the generator was really close to our electric items, it was no problem to connect them. But if you don't have to, if you don't happen to be that lucky, power conduits can be found in the power section. And you see here these blue lines, you can just draw power conduits just like that. They're like what they're like walls place down like walls, needing one steel and just transporting the power from one place to another. We're going to demonstrate that in later runs. I've also talked about how to set up builds and how to cook meals and how to hunt and how to plant food. As we see here, Pi has gone crazy planting out rice, corn and strawberries. Okay, so next episode I'm going to talk about in detail about the needs of your people. I'm going to explain all these things and yeah. Feel free to ask away if there are any topics that you want to know or if there's anything you feel like it's still bothering you, I will answer as good as I can. Drop your comments down below, leave a like on that video if you enjoyed it and of course check out my channel. I do daily videos so just subscribe and turn on those notifications and you won't miss anything in the future. Beyond that, down there in the description you'll find my Twitch channel where I do daily streams and if you like that content maybe you want to check out those support links. Patreon, coffee, whatever it might please you. I'd be happy if you check them out. I sure don't mind if you don't because watching this video means so much to me. I'm already grateful for that. Have a nice day and see you soon. Bye-bye.